Yes, sir. Do it. I am. Julia, you ready? There we go. Good morning. The meeting is called to order. Mr. Trollman, has anyone signed up for public comment? Good morning. We have no public comments this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Miller. Good morning. We have no cases to reconsider under agenda item three. Is that correct? That is correct. No cases. All right. Let's now consider tax liability cases under agenda item four. Uh, I think we have one tax case on docket 29. Yes, sir. Uh, it's case number TD-20-021-0329. Commissioner Demerson? I agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Alvarez? I agree with staff's recommendation. And Mr. Chairman? I agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. All right. No fair housing cases on agenda item five. Correct. No cases. All right, agenda item six, we have one wage claim case pulled for additional discussion on docket 29. Yes, sir. It's case number 19-057125-4. Commissioner Alvarez? The WCAT should be affirmed. The employer's testimony is not credible. The notice of the change in pay agreement that is in evidence is undated. No one in the management or ownership signed the alleged notice, and the claimant denied ever receiving it. The testimony of the employer's witnesses is contradicted by the employer's actions. The employer, a company in financial trouble, alleges that the claimant was owed less than $5,000, but the employer paid the claimant $8,000. These payments were made after the claimant left the employer and was no longer issuing paychecks. The party's performance is sufficient evidence that the employer agreed to pay the claimant hourly wage per diem and car expenses. The claimant was being paid per diem that was not for any actual expenses occurred incurred, but was instead uh, dis um, disguised wages. Under the pay agreement described by the claimant, the employer owed the 8,560 total and paid her 8,000. Accordingly, the claimant is owed an additional $560. Affirm the WCAT wages, wage claim part timely, wages owed $560. Uh, the AT decision should be modified as recommended by staff. I agree that the wage claim was partly timely. The claim had no credible documentation signed by the employer $16.50 per hour with the per diem added to her as she claimed. On the contrary, the employer's two financial and administrative employees with the best knowledge of the wage agreement gave credible firsthand testimony that the claimant was only supposed to be paid $9 per hour with no per diem <coughs> and that the claimant used her access to the employer's records to make it appear that she was being paid at a higher rate. In reality, the company overpaid her and does not owe her any additional pay. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision as recommended. The wage claim was partly timely. The claimant is not entitled to any additional wages. Modify the WCAT wage claim timely in part, wage claim dismissed, no wages owed. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. That was the last case pulled for discussion on docket 29. You should have received the wage claim short form dissent list. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining wage claim cases on docket 29. I second the motion except for those cases on which I am dissenting as reflected of the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 29. And I uh, concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I am dissenting as reflected in the wage claim short form the list, uh, the sent list for docket 29. Uh, motion passes with the exceptions noted. Thank you. Uh, let's move to agenda item seven in consideration of unemployment insurance cases on docket 29. Proceed when you're ready, please. Case number 2424267, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, the AT decision should be modified. I do not contest the good cause rulings. However, I disagree with the decision on the job separation. The employer's appeal, which was available to the AT, stated that the claimant was discharged for falsifying records and forging client signatures. Such activity constitutes work-connected misconduct and the employer would not have been billed had this been the last separation before the claimant filed his claim. Since this undisputed information clearly established that the claimant was discharged for work-connected misconduct, we should modify the AT decision. The employer did not establish a good cause for its non-appearance. 
reimburse the employer, not bills. I would affirm the employer failed to establish good cause for their three non appearances and the underlying record supports billing the employer. Affirm the AT, no good cause for the employer, for the employer AT3, AT2, AT1 bill reimbursing employer. Affirm the AT, employer did not establish good cause for AT3, AT2, or AT1 bill to reimburse an employer. Short form sent. Thank you. I have a short form to send for Commissioner Demerson. Next case, 2477531, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. The claimant had good cause for missing the AT3 because he called at the correct time in his own time zone. The claimant had good cause for missing the AT2 because he made a good faith effort to participate in the hearing and the claimant had good cause for missing the AT1 because he did not receive the hearing packet prior to the hearing due to USPS mistakenly forwarding his mail. The claimant last worked on 11-27-19 before being suspended without pay. When the claimant filed the IC on 11-30-19, he was not working and earning wages and therefore was unemployed and filed a valid claim. With regard to the job separation, the claimant had only worked for the employer for six months. On the night the oil spill was discovered, the claimant's supervisor was on site. The claimant's work was performed in accordance with the supervisor's instructions. The claimant is not responsible for the supervisor's failure to complete paperwork and notify the chain of command about the oil spill. The evidence is insufficient to establish misconduct. Modify the AT, claimant had good cause for the three non-appearances, no misconduct, charge of act, void adequate response ruling. Uh, the appeal tribunal decision should be modified. I do not contest the validity of the claim issue and agree that the claimant had good cause for missing the AT3. However, as to the AT2, after the claimant registered for the hearing, he went to get something to eat and lost his phone, which he could not locate for several hours. The claimant had also put his phone on silent. These were circumstances within the claimant's power to control, and he therefore did not have good cause for missing AT2. The remainder of the record available to the AT at the time supports the finding of misconduct, and we should modify the AT decision. The claimant had good cause for his non-appearance at AT3. The claimant did not have good cause for his non-appearance at AT2. The claimant filed a valid claim, misconduct, no charge back, several adequate response. However, even if the claimant did have good cause for his non-appearance, the AT decision should still be modified. The claimant and his crew were responsible for signing a job hazardous analysis, JHA form. The claimant admitted that the crew did not complete the form. The claimant further stated that he could have asked for the form, but he did not and that he notified no one in the upper management that he did not sign the form. In addition, the employer stated that the claimant and his crew were supposed to do hourly walk-arounds to inspect equipment and that their failure to properly do this resulted in an oil spill to start and continue for longer than it should have. Of the claimant's three-person crew, two were fired while the other one chose to quit. As such, the claimant's failure to follow the employer's protocols was mismanagement of his position of employment and we should modify the AT decision. The claimant had good cause for his non-appearance. The claimant filed a valid claim, misconduct, no charge back, sever adequate response. Modify the AT. Claim established good cause for AT3, AT2, and AT1. Valid claim, misconduct, no charge back, sever adequate response. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form to send for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2482481, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. The claimant was working during the AT1 and therefore established good cause for her non-appearance. With regard to the job separation, the claimant should be qualified for benefits. The claimant has had ongoing and continuous work with the same client. There is no evidence that the claimant was ever told that her assignment with the client was ending. The employer was unable to provide any testimony or evidence that the claimant was told that her assignment was ending. In the absence of evidence that the claimant was informed that her assignment with the client was ending, it is not possible to apply the employer's contact policy. Modify the AT, good cause for the claimant's non-appearance, no voluntary leave. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. I do not contest the good cause ruling. 
As to the job separation, the preponderance of the evidence establishes that the claimant failed to comply with the reporting policy of the employer, a temporary help firm. The policy informed the claimant that noncompliance could affect her unemployment benefits. As such, the claimant separation constituted a voluntary quit without good cause connected with the work. We should affirm the AT decision. The claimant had good cause for a non-appearance, voluntary leaving. Affirm the AT. Claimant established good cause for AT1, voluntary leaving. Short form dissent. Yes, thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2482632, Commissioner Demerson. The AT decision should be reversed. We voted on docket 26 on the good cause issue. On the job separation, the employer's testimony should hold the most weight since the claimant's statements evolved over time. The employer received word that the claimant, a general manager, asked a subordinate for a picture of her in her nightgown. The claimant had received a prior warning for similar behavior. In his initial statements to the commission, the claimant did not deny the incident. Instead, he stated that he did not remember asking the subordinate for a picture. This is not a denial. Only when the case progressed to an AT hearing did the claimant deny the final incident. Conversely, the employer credibly testified that the claimant admitted his conduct to the employer. Such admissions against interest constitute an exception to the hearsay rules. In addition, during that conversation, the claimant admitted that he had messed up. The claimant's explanation as to what he meant when he said that is unreasonable. As such, the employer has met its burden to prove misconduct. In addition, this case should be viewed as a resignation in lieu of discharge since the employer testified that the claimant quit before he was officially notified of his termination. Quitting in anticipation of discharge is also disqualifying. We should therefore reverse the AT decision. The employer had good cause for its non-appearance, misconduct, no charge back, adequate employer response. The decision should be modified. We, pre we previously found the employer had good cause. Regarding the merits, the claimant denied the allegations under oath and the employer did not present firsthand testimony. Although a recording supposedly exists, it was not provided for the hearing. As such, the greater weight of the evidence supports a finding of no misconduct. Modify the AT, employer had good cause, no misconduct, charge back. Modify the AT, employer established good cause for AT1, no misconduct, charge back. A short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Demerson. Next case, 2500165, Commissioner Demerson. The employer's appeal should be deemed timely. The employer's appeal was late due to receiving an unprecedented amount of TWC unemployment claim correspondence, claims that were undoubtedly related to the COVID-19 pandemic. The overwhelming amount of TWC documentation received by this employer led to inevitable delays in its responses. The employer should not be penalized for late appeals under these circumstances because the situation was not reasonably predictable and the employer's response was finite. Accordingly, we should find the employer's appeal timely and resubmit. Although the employer provided a reason for filing their appeal three weeks late, their reason does not fit a generally accepted timeliness exception. Therefore, the employer's commission appeal should be dismissed as late. You know, we've received regular briefings on UI claims and system performance. We've not been informed that the filing of appeals has been impacted. Because timeliness is a jurisdictional issue, I do not feel comfortable granting timeliness in the absence of any information that TWC systems prevented timely filings of appeals. If my fellow commissioners would agree, I would propose holding this case in order to be briefed on whether system issues impacted the filing of appeals. I agree. I would agree to that. All right. We will hold the case and resubmit following a briefing. Next case. Next case, 2501079, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision on the timeliness issue should be reversed. The claimant attempted to submit his appeal by the 14-day deadline, but was prevented from doing so because problems with the commission's communication system prevented him from submitting his appeal online. The claimant also attempted to obtain assistance on his local workforce solutions office, but it was closed. 
and a sign there instructed him to file the appeal online. Given the lack of available commission resources and the problems with the online system, the appeal should be deemed timely. Deem appeal timely and resubmit the case on the merits. The appeal to render decision should be affirmed. The claimant's appeal was late. There were multiple methods the claimant could have used to appeal, but the claimant did not exhaust those methods. There are no good cause exceptions to the timeliness rule, and as such, we should affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal conduct. Again, we've received regular briefings on UI claims and system performance. We've not been informed that the filing of appeals has been impacted. Because timeliness is a jurisdictional issue, I do not feel comfortable granting timeliness in the absence of any information that PwC systems prevented timely filings of appeals. If my fellow commissioners would agree, I would propose holding this case in order to be briefed on whether system issues impacted the filing of appeals. All right, thank you. We will hold this case and resubmit after the briefing. I would agree to that. Next case number? 2501931, Commissioner Alvarez. This case should be remanded. During the hearing, the claimant requested documents he believed he submitted to be entered into record. The hearing officer denied the claimant's request to submit the documents during the hearing and chose not to continue the case. The documents are material to the issues in this case. The hearing officer's actions violated the claimant's due process rights, and in this case should be remanded to enter the documents into record. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The proponents of the evidence established this that the claimant did not respond to a service call during the relevant portion of his shift. The employer also stated that the claimant had received verbal warnings for other job performance-related issues. As such, the claimant's actions constituted misconduct connected with the work. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, misconduct. I would agree with an opportunity to submit the evidence that he previously attempted to provide the commission. I believe Commissioner Alvarez's vote was to remand, and I could concur with that. Thank you. We have the majority vote to remand the case for the admission of the documents. That's short-form dissent. And Commissioner Jamerson, I have your short-form dissent. Next case. Next case. 2503458, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable, and it improperly held that Section 207.021A1 of the Act requires claimants to register in their home states. The Act and rules only requires claimants to register with the Public Employment Office serving their area of residence. The claimant regularly lives and works in Texas and intends to work, correction, intends to return to work in Texas when her employer rehires. While the claimant has a permanent address in Alabama, she only visits the property for vacation and during layoffs. The claimant registered in Texas on March 9, 2019, correction, 2020, one day after the beginning of the reporting and eligibility. As the claimant regularly worked and resided in Texas, Texas is a state of residence for her, and her resignation, her registration in Texas is sufficient. Reverse the 18, no registration in eligibility. The appeal to renew decision should be affirmed. The claimant testified that her permanent home is in Alabama. The claimant did not register in that state until April 20, 2020, for a screenshot document. File documents also contain a portion of the TWC handbook which notifies the reader that if you live in another state, register at a public workforce office in that state. As such, the registration in eligibility should remain intact. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, registration not eligible from March 8, 2020 through April 18, 2020. My vote is to rehear the case to obtain evidence when the claimant first registered in Alabama. All right, there's not yet a majority vote. I would be okay with the rehear. All right, we have a majority vote to rehear the case to develop when the claimant first registered in Alabama. Next case. Next case, 2505009, Commissioner Alvarez. The claimant's father testified he is a primary individual to check the mailbox at the address of record. He did not receive the determination. There is no reason to doubt the credibility of the claimant's father. 
the claimant did not receive the determination and had been unable to log in to the TWC website. Deem the claimant's appeal timely and resubmit. The AT decision should be affirmed. The determination at issue was not returned to TWC as undeliverable. In addition, the claimant's father testified that the claimant's mother would occasionally check the mail. The claimant's mother did not testify, and there's no evidence that the claimant checked with his mother to see if she intercepted the notice. Since the AT was in the best position to determine the credibility of the parties, and since the claimant did not provide sufficient evidence to rebut the presumption of receipt, we should affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal, voluntary leaving, void chargeback. Reverse the AT, timely claimant appeal, resubmit. Thank you, we will resubmit. Next case, 2506-119, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision should be reversed. The claimant worked for one day and quit because she was required to move a heavy item, excuse me, a heavy item as part of her normal duties that exacerbated her back injury. She was not informed her, she was not informed before she accepted the job that she would be required to perform these duties and had no reason to think her position as a cashier would require this level of physicality. She provided medical documentation on her condition. The claimant quit due to a medically verified and non-disqualifying injury. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, no overpayment. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant was not advised by a doctor to resign, nor did she afford the employer an adequate opportunity to address her concerns before quitting. As such, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, overpayment of $1,600. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, overpayment. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2506-550, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The employer testified the claimant was discharged because she exceeded the allowable number of days on unpaid leave status. The claimant's final absences were a result of personal illness. Numerous medical documents have been submitted evidencing the claimant's illness. Since the claimant's absences resulting in her discharge were due to personal illness, the claimant should be qualified for benefits and the employer should be billed. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, bill reimbursed employer. We should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant's testimony was inconsistent, self-serving, and highly implausible. The proponents of the credible evidence established that the claimant's excessive and unnecessary absenteeism constitutes mismanagement of her position of employment. Therefore, we should affirm the AT decision, misconduct, reimbursement employer, not billed. Affirm the AT, misconduct, reimbursement employer, not billed. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2509-387, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The owner of the employer asked employees to sign a memo with work rules. One of the rules in the memo was the owner would take any complaints about the inappropriate behavior as a personal insult. The claimant wanted to clarify some parts of the memo. She spoke with the office manager who recommended the claimant clarify with the owners before signing. When the claimant asked the owner about the memo, she was sent home early and fired the next day. Asking for clarification is not misconduct connected with the work. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, charge back. We should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. The employer's memorandum indicated that failure to sign would result in termination. Thus, the claimant's refusal to sign the employer's reasonable work rules while waiting to ask a question about an issue not even addressed in the document constituted mismanagement of her position of employment. We should affirm the AT decision, misconduct, no charge back. While signed understandings of basic business practices are standard, an employer terminating an employee for asking for clarification before signing a binding document should not be reported. Claimant was terminated for reasons other than misconduct connected with the work and should remain eligible for benefits. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, charge back. A short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Demerson. Next case, 
2509639, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, we should grant a rehearing in this case. First, I strongly, strongly condemn the actions of the appliance company's employee. And I can appreciate the claimant's reaction to the employee's dismissive attitude of the, and use of a racial slur. However, we have not had the opportunity to review all relevant evidence related to the final incident. The client company provided the employer a video which allegedly shows the claimant threatening one of the client's employees. Because this evidence could be dispositive, we should rehear this case for submission and review of the video, this video before we render our decision in this case. The decision should be affirmed. The claimant worked as a truck driver. An employee of a client company directed a racial slur towards the claimant. In response, the claimant became understandably upset and argumentative. However, the claimant then left the client site and completed his job duties. As the claimant's actions were in response to an indefensible act by the client, the claimant's actions did not rise to the level of misconduct. Affirm the AT, no misconduct charge back. I would concur with Commissioner Demerson. Thank you. We'll rehear the case and then resubmit. Next case. 2518530, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision is fully supportable and should be affirmed. First, while the parties dispute the nature of, job, of the job separation, text messages between the parties clearly establish that the claimant initiated the job separation. The analysis then shifts to whether the claimant had good cause to quit. The claimant's testimony and text messages indicate that he quit because of his dissatisfaction with the new manager. The claimant admitted that during the first month of the new manager's employment, he did not complain to the employer about any problems he had had with her. In fact, the claimant's first complaint just a couple of business days before he quit. Thus, because the claimant did not provide the employer a reasonable opportunity to remedy his concern, the claimant quit without good cause connected with the work. And we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back. The decision should be reversed. After the claimant voiced concerns to the owner about the new manager's ability to perform her job, the owner asked for the claimant's keys and told him to take a few days off. The claimant was sent the owner to request to meet and discuss the issue in hopes of returning to work. However, the employer did not respond to the claimant's request. Therefore, the claimant had good cause to quit. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, charge back. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, charge back. A short form. Thank you. I have a short form to send for Commissioner Demerson. Next case, 2520772, Commissioner Demerson. We should reverse the appeal to review the decision. The claimant quit her job in the middle of the spring, 2019 spring term, while further work was still available and without signing the letter of reasonable assurance for the following school year. Because the employer had work assignments available every day and the claimant stopped requesting and accepting assignments without explanation, the evidence established that the claimant quit without good cause connected with work. Accordingly, we should reverse the AT decision, reimburse the employer, not bill. The claimant worked for the employer as an as-needed basis. In accordance with appeal number 212-CA-77, the claimant was involuntarily separated for reasons other than misconduct at the end of each period of employment. The claimant last worked for the employer on March 5, 2019, and was separated at the time for reasons other than misconduct. All other communication between the claimant and the employer after that date are immaterial to the separation. Affirm the AT, bill reimburse an employer. Reverse the AT, reimburse an employer, not bill. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2522959, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be affirmed. The claimant stopped performing services for the employer and was at least partially unemployed when she filed the claim. When she, when the employer reopened, the claimant was unable to return to work because it would require placing her three-year-old daughter in daycare. The claimant's daughter was born with a respiratory illness that made her a high risk that she would contract COVID-19. The claimant was provided medical documentation, correction, the claimant was provided medical documents establishing her daughter's illness. 
As the claimant was unable to return to work because she had to care for her minor child due to illness, the claimant had good cause to quit. Modify the 18, the claimant filed a valid claim, no voluntary leaving, bill reimbursing employer, and set aside adequate response. The appeal to render decision should be modified. I do not contest the validity of the claim mission. As to the job separation, the claimant quit her job. While the claimant may have had a good personal reason for resigning, such reason was not connected with the work. As we should modify the AT decision, the claimant filed a valid claim, voluntary leaving, reimbursing employer not bill, several adequate response. Modify the AT, valid claim, voluntary leaving, reimbursing employer not billed, several adequate response. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. Next case, 2537085, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision is fully supportable and should be affirmed. The claimant quit the day after his brother had a physical altercation with the operations manager. While the claimant may have been upset by his brother's account of what happened, the claimant did not complain to the employer about any concerns he had about the situation prior to quitting. Because the claimant did not provide the employer an opportunity to remedy his concerns before voluntary leaving his job, the claimant is considered to have quit without good cause connected with the work. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back. The decision should be reversed. Although the employer alleges the claimant had never complained about racial slurs directed at him by another individual, the claimant has submitted text messages showing he informed his boss. The employer's testimony regarding this matter is not credible. After reporting the slurs, the individual he reported beat up his brother and called him racial slurs. The claimant had good cause to quit when he was informed of his boss's conduct. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, charge back. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, charge back. Short form. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Demerson. And the final case is 2539680, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The claimant testified that her workplace was hostile and uncomfortable due to the unprofessional conduct of management. The claimant also presented testimony from her firm, former supervisor who stated that she was told by the VP of HR not to hire any more black people after the supervisor had hired the claimant. The VP of HR was, present, was present for the AT hearing but did not dispute the allegation. Therefore, the greater weight of the evidence indicates that the claimant had good cause to quit due to racial prejudice she faced at work. Reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving charge back. Uh, the AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant did not establish that her working conditions were intolerable. Therefore, she did not have good cause to quit, and we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no charge back. Short form dissent. Thank you. I have a short form dissent for Commissioner Alvarez. And that was the last pulled case for docket 29. You should have received the short form dissent list already. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining UI cases on docket 29. I second the motion except for those cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the UI short form list for docket 29. I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected in the UI short form dissent list for docket 29. Motion passes with the exceptions noted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This brings us to the end of agenda items three through seven. Let's pause for uh, two minutes to reset for the rest of the meeting.
go, Commissioner Dimerson. Chance to rejoin us. All right, there he is. Everybody ready to tackle the rest of this agenda? Yes, sir. Ready, ready. All right, then let's move to agenda item eight, discussion consideration regarding a policy concept on amendments to chapter 809, Fully Text Administrative Code, chapter 809, regarding local board policies related to child transfers between providers. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. Cerna. For the record, Allison Wilson, Child Care and Early Learning Division. This morning, we bring forward a policy concept for your consideration regarding local child care transfer policies. Section 98.453, of the final federal rule for CCDF requires states to ensure that payments for subsidized child care reflect generally accepted payment practices of child care providers that serve children who do not receive CCDF subsidies. Providers generally require private pay families to give notice before withdrawing their child from a program. These policies help providers maintain enrollment efficiency and manage their operating budgets. Child Care Services Rule 8913 requires boards to establish a policy for the transfer of a child between providers. However, the rule does not require boards to establish a waiting period for families that request to transfer a child to another provider. Staff seeks direction on amending Chapter 809.13 to establish a two-week waiting period in the board's transfer policy. The waiting period shall apply only to transfer requests that are unrelated to a status with child care regulation. Additionally, staff seeks direction on amending 80913 to authorize boards to establish procedures to consider exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. That concludes my remarks and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. All right, thank you. Questions or comments? No questions, Chairman. None here, thank you. Do we have any motion? I move that we approve the policy concept for the amendments to chapter 809 regarding subsidized child care transfer policies as discussed by staff. Second. And moved and seconded. We're unanimous. Thank you. Thanks. Item 9, chapter 800 AEL rules is being deferred to a later time. bring us to item 10 discussion consideration of possible action regarding the addition of a vocational rehabilitation and vocational adjustment training course entitled exploring secondary education and training good morning commissioners for the record jason vaden vocational rehabilitation division vocational adjustment training is designed to help customers develop the competencies and essential skills necessary to function successfully on the job in post-secondary education and training and in the Currently, VR offers multiple vocational adjustment training courses for our customers, which cover a wide variety of topics. However, given the importance of post-secondary education and training for VR customers seeking either entry or advancement in their chosen career path, staff have identified the need for a new course designed to focus on the exploration of post-secondary education, including highlighting post-secondary education programs, available disability support services, skills needed to succeed, and applying and paying for college. This morning, staff seeks direction on expanding the vocational adjustment training options to include a course called Exploring Post-Secondary Education and Training, and with it corresponding rate and requirements as reflected in your materials. Commissioners, this concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. All right, thank you. Comments or questions? Good report. Thank you, Jason, for the update. I'm here. Are there any motions? I move that we expand the vocational adjustments training options to include a course called Exploring Post-Secondary Education and Training as discussed by staff. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. We're unanimous. Thank you. On item 11, uh, staff does not have anything to present for item 11. <clears throat> Item 12, discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding guidance on resource utilization and implementation of services and strategies to target disaster relief efforts and public health emergencies, including those funded with the Department of Labor's Disaster Dislocated Worker Grant. Ed, we have under this item. I know I'm down for this item, but I think Courtney Arbor is going to actually present. Great. Thank you. 
That's right. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Courtney Arbor with the Workforce uh, Division. Uh, today, I wanted to provide an update on the status of the projects we've recently begun on the workforce recovery side. As you know, there's much work underway with workforce boards, adult education literacy providers, and other grantees to support unemployed Texans in returning to work with a focus there locally on job readiness, job matching, and upskilling. At the state level, the online learning project is also underway with more than 25,000 unemployment recipients invited to the platform to participate in no cost coursework. And over the next few days, all recipients of unemployment insurance will receive the invitation to participate. The coursework available to them includes more than 4,000 courses in both technical and workplace skills content. As of today, 100 claimants have begun courses and half of those have completed at least one. Those who haven't responded to the invitation will receive a nudge from TWC or a local board encouraging them to take advantage of the opportunity. The call centers are also up and running, supporting claimants in their job search. More than 1,200 claimants have received help with resume development and developing their profile and work in Texas, which will help them to match to available jobs. Uh, we have some really good news. Of those that have been contacted, 634 have let us know that they've gone back to work, so we've been able to congratulate them and ga gather some details from them, uh, and the work will continue. We will provide updates on these projects and the customers who are in training uh, and being served going back to work during, during our regular briefings with you all. All right, thank you. Questions or comments? No questions at this time. I'm just looking forward to the updated reports. Good work. Great, agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Anything else under item 12? No, sir, that's all. That's all. Let's move to agenda item 13, discussion consideration and possible action regarding approval of local workforce development board nominees. Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner morning. Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, and Mr. Cerna. For the record, Shanta Williams with the Workforce Development Division. And before you for consideration, we have workforce board nominees for Workforce Solutions. Cameron County, South Texas, Heart of Texas, Middle Rio Grande, Central Texas, the Coastal Bend, and Permian Basin. Staff, staff recommends that all nominees be approved, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. All right, comments or questions? No questions, Chairman. None here. Do we have any motions? Chairman, I move that we approve the board nominees for Cameron County, South Texas, the Heart of Texas, Middle Rio Grande, Central Texas, the Coastal Bend, and Permian Basin. A second. It's been moved and seconded. And we're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 14. This is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the Texas Workforce Commission Agency Strategic Plan for fiscal years 2021 through 2025. Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, and Mr. Serta. For the record, I'm Margaret Heshkin, Director of Communications. Um, commissioners, you have before you the fiscal year 2021 through 25 TWC strategic plan for your consideration and approval. Um, I'd like to say thank you and your members of your staff and other team members from across the agency for contributing to the report. For the report as a whole, Commissioners, I'm requesting approval for a plan with your permission to make any technical corrections as necessary prior to final submission. I'm also happy to answer any questions or accept any changes you might have. Comments or questions? Chairman, I have a, I have a, first of all, I'd like to make a comment and then I have a couple of things that I'd like to add if, if it's okay with the commission. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Margaret and her team for putting this draft plan together and for all the work that you've dedicated and, and by working with the offices on this. It's a really good message uh, to our constituents and I appreciate your cooperation on this. There's a couple of things that I would like to see if it's possible. After reading it a couple of times, I'm glad to see that we shortened the, the, um, the remarks from the commission. On the uh, tagline, um, we have it on page 182 of the report. Um, I was wondering if we could, uh, where it says work in Texas, if it would be possible uh, for us an agreement that we would include the tagline for jobs find you on page 182 of the report, the body of the report. Um, it's the TWC outreach to customers. Um, it says they're for employers and workers work in Texas um, around that line 19 uh, of page correction. 
on page 181, 182 is where the message body is. And I'd like to see, um, again, the, the tagline, where the jobs find you. Um, that would be one uh, a recommendation. The other is in the messaging. Yes. I'm trying to go back, I'm trying to find it. I wanna make sure I'm keeping, keeping It's it on page 182. Thanks. So, um, I, I, I want to give Commissioner Alvarez a, a, an opportunity to, to lay out his uh, his potential changes. Uh, one point of clarification, though, uh, and I and I want to make sure we understand how we move forward on this. So, page one would be in part two. And my understanding of today's vote is we will be passing out part. one which is pages four through um, about 21, four through 21. And that today we're not voting on anything that follows page 21. Now that's my understanding of this agenda item. If, if there's any information to the contrary, um, please let me know right now. Chairman, I was not aware of that. I was, I was informed that we would be working on the whole report today. So uh, I'd be willing to revisit this. Um, so We've been working on this for some time, but that's not the message that we got. Uh, Commissioner, this is, uh, Commissioner, this is Tom McCarty. We, uh, today before you is the entire report, both uh, part one and part two uh, for consideration. So what is part one? Part one, commissioners, is the section that deals with uh, from the uh, Commissioner's message, uh, the parts just before that with the uh, agency's mission, vision, philosophy, commissioner's message, the goals, uh, mm -hmm. internal, external assessments. And I think that's the last part of, uh, and then redundancies and impediments. And then that, and then after that begins part two. And part two is the, the data elements that um, are prescribed by the instructions from LEB and the office of the governor for um, the data elements that we have to include in there. Okay, so um, page 181, then Commissioner Alvarez, you had indicated you would like to use the tagline from Work in Texas there. Yes, so on page, and I, I'm corrected, I'm looking at my copy. Chairman, I, I received multiple copies, so I'm going to look at the very last copy that we received from staff on Friday and was printed out to me. So on page 182, and that's why I apologize for uh, my remarks earlier on 182 line one, there's a statement that says work in Texas is supported by 180 workforce solutions offices around the state. If possible and agreed with the commission, um, we did spend a lot of money and, and I know that we've been using the work in Texas at our virtual town hall and our stakeholder meetings. And I have referenced the, uh, the tagline uh, where jobs find you uh, multiple times. Uh, it was just a recommendation and suggestion on my part. And that would be, again, on page 182, line one. So, so your suggested changes are on page 181 and 182 to include the Work in Texas tagline where jobs find you in those specific uh, references that you made. Yes, sir. So it would be in parentheses following Work in Texas, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and it would be referenced there. That was my first comment. Okay. My other one, very simple, anywhere where we reference work in Texas, and we do have it on page five of the summary and page 182 of the body, we have the word work in Texas or the, uh, the uh, link. So what I would like to see if, if it's okay is when we reference workintexas.com that it be in bold would be one and the other that every time someone presses the hyperlink it would direct them to our work to our um, to our um, our, um, our website. And Commissioner Alvarez that will that will be an online version when it's uh, presented to legislature online it will be linked. I'm sorry, Margaret, I lost you. That will happen on the online version, Commissioner, when it's um, in the online version to the legislature. When they, link, when they click on that, it will be linked. Perfect. And again, the wording, the hard copy, I was just asking 
on the recommendation too that if we could put it in bold just to highlight it on page five of the messaging from the, the, the commissioners and page 182 where it's referenced. Those are the only two areas where it's referenced in the report. Okay. But that's up to you guys. Just a recommendation, sure. Chairman. Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Demerson. No, th those sound, sound fine. Um, I don't see any heartburn. Okay, yeah, I, I have no objection on that, so. And those are all my comments and recommendations, Chairman. All right. Commissioner Demerson, do you have any further comments? No, just uh, the message from the commissioners. Uh, uh, let, let's get, continue to work on that uh, message, and, and we'll we'll get that squared away. Uh, one thing that I just need to, to point out is uh, the reference to the 28 local workforce uh, boards. And again, I think Margaret is asking for uh, different I mean, technical uh, adjustments that they, they can make that. And so uh, I'll make sure that we reference uh, the 28 local workforce boards in some some capacity in that message that comes from us. Okay. When, when you say continue to work on that, are you are you anticipating uh, future or, or coming edits to that? I would think that this one would be edited in some form or fashion uh, that presented. Uh, if this is our final adoption of this message, uh, then I may may have some concerns with that or there's some things that I, I, we, we want to probably add in, into this uh, this document. Nothing substantial, I don't think. Uh, is this the uh, the final look? So what we're going to vote on today, this is it. That that's my understanding. Yes, sir, it is. Boy, what, chairman, I apologize. What's chairman, I apologize. I wasn't aware about the sections that we were going to take action on. So again, no, I'd be no, okay no. with revisiting this at any at a further time if you'd like. Well, we're running we're running out of time. Um, yes, sir. Concern. Um, this is due to um, due August one, Chairman. Yeah, it's due at the end of the month. So uh, today is the what the twenty first. So there'd be one more meeting. Oh, that's that's cutting it awfully close. If we if we bring it up for a vote at the next meeting, I'm I'm game to do that. Uh, I, I'm particularly concerned, uh, Commissioner Alvarez. Your 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 suggestions are well taken and. And you know, included without objection, and I think that was appropriate to do today. I'm concerned if Commissioner Demerson has a, additional edits that he would like to make. If we vote today, I don't know that that will happen, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't know a mechanism to really sustain any any uh, significant edits that aren't, you know, grammar, syntax, punctuation, etc. Uh, if we take a vote today, I I. I would be okay pushing it to Tuesday, but we gotta we gotta wrap it up next Tuesday, uh, and be done with it if we need another week to do that. It, it, does that cause any major um, problems for staff who who actually have to coordinate the submission of this report? Chairman, I'll defer to Tom. I mean, we do have accessibility and layout, so all of that would have to be done and completed. Everything completed by and submitted by August one. Tom, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, that uh, this is Tom. Uh, that covers pretty much what we need to do on the back end in order to submit this. We have been taking steps to do as much as we can uh, in advance of the layout just to be able to speed up that process, commissioners. Yeah. Let, let, let me let me do this. Um, basically, this this um, to my concern. <clears throat> my concern. I think Commissioner Alvarez is is uh, gone over his, and so I'll I'll go over what I uh, uh, have brought up on the message for from the commissioners is not a lot so I, I can actually add that in there and that way we're not delayed on this part um mr chairman i mean the schedule a part the budget structure and, and all of that uh we were instructed to look at only pages up to 21 are, are you okay with the fact that we may not have reviewed the other documents or so yeah i think we can move the whole thing out today okay all right so let me let me go ahead and hit my points here and, and let's that, that takes care of that. And so you guys can kind of, uh, uh, we'll kind of try to figure this out. Maybe Margaret, you guys uh, can kind of wordsmith this. But if we're getting to on the message from the commissioners and we're about um, line 11, we talk about what we're doing in terms of doubling our call centers and, and, and those things. We may want to uh, implement, uh, in, institute the seven days a week. We're doing, we're going from seven to seven uh, working uh, seven days a week, the hours or whatever, that's not in there. And so I think uh, something to that, 
that say we talked about the uh, uh, we're doubling our call centers from four to eight, expanding server handling uh, claims from five to twenty, incorporating artificial intelligence to reward winning chat boxes. So we may want to say, in addition, we increased our hours from seven to seven, uh, seven days a week uh, along those lines. That that's not in there, and that's uh, that's something that we may want to place in there. Um, moving to line seventeen. Uh, where it says, uh, thanks to the strong resources of our state, uh, may put that include our employers, workforce, and diverse industry uh, sectors. And that's more grammatical uh, from that point. Uh, on line 17, Texas workforce is more than 13 million individuals ready to meet the needs of more than five, the 550,000 plus employers. I don't think we have 13 million individuals right now. And so we may need to look at that number uh, right now, it may be down more to 11 million at this, this point, but uh, let's look at that to make sure we're factual there in, in terms of uh, uh, what our message is to, to individuals out there. Um, moving to line item, I guess it's 21. My, my pages are not numbered. I can't see this, this in the space. Where it's referring to, uh, I think it's uh, line 20. Continued efforts to meet the state's higher education 60 by 30 Texas goal will include initiatives to improve quality in their early child care uh, and increase uh, post-secondary education successes. Uh, 60 by 30 is tied to certifications. And so I don't know if we want to place anything with certifications in there. Um, this, is, this is talking about improving in early childhood education and increased post-secondary education successes. And so hopefully, if that ties in certifications, we're fine. But if uh, you think it doesn't, then we need, need to do that. And then lastly, um, uh, somewhere in here, I want to add, continue, we, we continue to rely on our 28 local workforce boards to deliver legendary customer service to our Texas employers uh, and employees. And so there's no reference to our 28 local workforce boards anywhere in this message from the commissioners. And I, I like that to, uh, to reflect. Um, because the rubber meets the road at the local level, and we don't like something along those lines to, uh, to be placed here. And I said lastly, but I actually returned the page, uh, the next to last paragraph, uh, TWC will continue and expand valuable training opportunities for both rural and urban communities, to say through programs such as the Skills Development Fund. So through programs such as the Skills Development Fund, which provides grants, et cetera. So those are my uh, quick comments um, on the message from the commissioners and one, one other, since we're taking this document on line item three, uh, where it says provide to Texas workers, employers, uh, job seekers, businesses, we probably should, that should probably be small businesses. And so we have employers there and businesses and those are almost one and the same, the small businesses kind of ties to what we, we another, uh, constituent base that we deal with, that we serve. Those are my comments. All right. Uh, Commissioner Alvarez, any concerns? Well, I understand the, um, I understand that we need to submit this pretty quick and it's really difficult for us to do this, you know, jointly because of the document. Um, you know, the only things that I addressed were just um, I was looking at the, the strap plan that we submitted two years ago where we did reference Harvey, but there wasn't a big an emphasis on Harvey. It was more what the, um, what, uh, the agency was doing. And we have to keep in mind that um, this is a five-year strap plan. Um, uh, the rec the uh, suggestions, recommendations that Commissioner Demerson brought out are valid. Um, I mean, my, my only messaging was um, just to focus on the, um, you know, pretty much the positive and the actual things that were taking place. I agree with some of the line items that he referenced on the 13 million working individuals. But uh, again, this was prior to COVID. I, I, I just didn't want the report to focus on just COVID uh, responses. And, and I agree with the recommendations he made, but we've been working on this for about two weeks now. And I mean, I don't know what my position is going to be next Tuesday on some of the recommendations because, again, my focus is I, I did I did look at his line IT 18 and, and I apologize. 
my hard copy has different page pages and numbers than the PDF. And so I'm just gonna go back to what I have here in front of me. And the 550,000, I know we discussed that with staff, that was pretty accurate. And that was prior to COVID. Uh, my question about the 13 million individuals working, uh, it was 14 prior to COVID. Uh, Chairman, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm up for discussion on how you wanna handle and proceed. Yeah. Uh, well, here's what I think. Uh, I think this is very difficult to do on Zoom. And I think that our numbers aren't even corresponding. And I think, unfortunately, what that means is, is that staff should um, take into account um, what you offered, Commissioner Alvarez, make appropriate changes to the document. Um, I, I heard you say that you had no objection with the with the sort of substance of, of uh, Commissioner Thimerson's edits. I would agree. I have no objection with, with what he's trying to do, but I would want to see the final wording on that before I voted. And so I think what that means is, is this needs to be postponed to next Tuesday. Uh, we will have to vote at that time, and that way we can see exactly what the document reads. So I think that um, I, I heard no objection to anything that you or Commissioner Thimerson uh, said Commissioner Alvarez, and um, my recommendation would be uh, that we bring this up for a vote next Tuesday, and that be our final vote, and then it moves forward. I, I agree with that, Chairman. And you know the um, the points that Commissioner Demerson brought out were valid. Um, I could see a section in the body of the report where we could talk about what we did during COVID, like uh, the number of what were the employment numbers were, um, the extending of hours of operation for our call centers. The points that he brought out were valid. And so I, I see a section, if it's okay, somewhere in the body of the report to put there, uh, during the COVID phase of the report, this is what we experienced. Yeah, so staff has that information um, as he presented it. Um, let's let them make those changes. This will come back before the commission next Tuesday for a vote, barring any objection from, from either of the, my fellow commissioners. I'm okay with that, Chairman. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear an objection then. So uh, let's uh, make those changes as agreed to today, bring us back for a final vote next Tuesday. Thank you, commissioners. All right, uh, do we have a legislative report today? Uh, yes, sir, commissioners, we do. Um, getting over those notes real quick. Uh, good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Dimerson, and Mr. Cerner for the record, Tom McCarty, External Relations. Uh, yesterday, Comptroller Hagar released a version of the Comptroller's fiscal, fiscal year 2019-2020 certification revenue estimate. Uh, the Comptroller revised the CRE from 121.76 billion to available revenue to 110.19 billion, which reflects a reduction of 11.57 billion uh, from last October CRE. The two largest factors in the revised CRE is the ongoing impact of COVID-19 and the decline in oil prices. Uh, the primary impact of the revised CRE is that the comptroller now projects a 4.58 billion shortfall for the current fiscal year instead of the 2.89 billion surplus projected in October. We are monitoring uh, one federal hearing uh, this week uh, this morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, the U.S. House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity is holding a hearing titled Getting Veterans Back to Work After COVID-19. Uh, Congress has returned from recess and will be monitoring any of the uh, COVID-19 related legislation that may uh, come up during this time period. We'll keep you updated and uh, advised uh, as, that, as any legislation moves through that process. This concludes my remarks and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any comments or questions? No, sir. None here. All right. Thank you. Um, Ed, do we have an executive director's report today? Just two quick notes um, that I would have mentioned last week, but we hadn't, uh, hadn't actually uh, sprung the surprise on one of the individuals. But we did have two employees that won uh, awards for their, uh, their hard work. The first was Patricia Espinosa. Uh, she won the Government Technology Magazine Outstanding IT Service and Support Award that goes to an individual that distinguishes themselves for exemplary service and support to an organization. And the other was to John Fowler, who won the Task uh, Trailblazer Award. Uh, Mr. Fowler was surprised uh, 
uh, in a presentation uh, in-house by Heather and Cole, uh, Clay Cole and I, um, and we hadn't and talked we had to him before uh, the commission uh, meeting, and I wanted to spring the surprise on him first, but he won the Trailblazer Award uh, by task, which is uh, awarded to an individual who has impacted the organization through strong leadership and dedication and also uh, recognizing um, uh, mentoring and, uh, and bringing up other individuals within the organization with those same values. So we're very pleased to announce that both John Fowler and Patricia Espinosa in our IT department have been uh, award winners of two from two different organizations. All right. And that's all I have, sir. All right. Well, congratulations uh, for uh, exemplary uh, service to POC. That's awesome. All right, anything else to come before the commission? No. Is there a motion to adjourn? Chairman, before I move to adjourn, I want to congratulate Ms. Espinosa and Mr. Fowler for their accomplishments and their awards representing the agency well. We appreciate their hard work. Absolutely. With that, with that I, uh, I move that we adjourn, sir. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you.